Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about my experience over at um, Standing Rock and um, it's taken me about a month to gather my thoughts and kind of figure out what I wanted to stay. Um, I signed up um, as a veteran, but I'm also Native American and I wanted to go ever since this thing first started and when they said they were you know sending veterans to Standing Rock I said I've definitely got to go now and I signed up to be a volunteer not realizing exactly what I was getting myself into I get the list and it's like 236 Californians which happened to be the most um, veterans going from any state and I'm like okay I'm up for it I did have some help uh, recruited somebody from Sacramento to come and help me divide it into regions. I had 13 RTLs, which is regional transportation leaders, all of which did a fantastic job and I've made some incredible friends. And so my job was to get the veterans there, which I did. There was no contingency as to my uh, part in this deployment when we got there. So I figured my job is done. My job is done. I got you here and once we got into camp, it should have been handed over to somebody else and it obviously wasn't. Um, I don't know if they assumed or expected me. I'm not even sure what word to use as far as that is concerned about um, if I was expected to lead once we got there because I have zero experience in leadership on the ground. Um, you give me a list of people that I need to organize and I, no problem, I can do it. I'm a caterer and I'm used to logistics like that and I can do that, but as far as anything on the ground as to where we needed to be when we had zero information about um, anything. I was led to believe there were going to be combat tents there, heated combat tents for the veterans, and I figured we would just roll into camp and hey, your tent's over there, and that was, you know, like a regular deployment, like when you're going anywhere. Uh, when I was in the Army, that's basically it. Hey, this tent is for you guys, this company, and that platoon, and that squad, and so on, and none of that happened. And like my friend Emmy had said, that every turn, it was something gone awry. Nothing, 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 nothing was easy. It was obstacles and blockades and I mean this figuratively that every little thing had a problem uh, something as simple as going to Fort Yates and finding out where the press conference is just to find out that it had already been done that morning we drove around for what seemed like 40 minutes because the RTL I put in charge of that group didn't know what the hell she was doing I got on the bus it was her bus it was her group I kind of stayed in the background a little bit said I'm just going to stay here in case something happens I did manage to stand up and told her that she needed to leave and relieved her of, of her duties. But there was just too many problems. There was no logistics on the ground. There was no communication. I think the two words that I heard the most was disorganized and lack of communication. Um, there should have been more satellite uh, outposts, I guess, because that camp is huge. I would have set up a maybe six or seven outposts where you can actually go and have decent reception for your phone calls and your internet and have walkie talkies and then you know start with one person and then trickle down to this person and then trickle down to that person at least somebody on the other side of the camp would know what's going on the other side of the camp a lot of people did not know what was going on and I got sick the very next day because my body is not used to that kind of cold and I've never felt cold like that before in my life and I had no clue that my body was going to react the way it did. Um, I had no intentions of staying in camp during the night. I was going to stay somewhere else, um, maybe Eagle Butte to help out there where I was best suited and it, it didn't happen. So I got kind of stuck. Um, at night the first night and went and found a warming tent and um, it was still cold I mean I mean it was warm I was slept in a t-shirt but as long as somebody was keeping wood on the fire it was warm and you have to drink water you have to stay hydrated and I happened didn't drink a lot of water I got dehydrated got a headache got stomach cramps and started drinking more water once I got in the tent and uh, realized, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to go to the bathroom. 
and I didn't have a flashlight because I couldn't find it. It got lost somewhere in the warming tent. And the closest bathroom was 50 yards away and it was icy and I, my boots were not the right boots to have to walk on icy ground and I managed to get over there not realizing I was going to peel away five layers just to go to the bathroom. But I wanted to say that um, a lot of people came that were not on the roster. We had, I, I believe, 2,500 extra vets who came um, that were not on the roster and now they are expecting to get reimbursed for their costs, which they were told that if you're not on the roster, you're not going to get reimbursed. And they, they said that over and over again, but if it's about the money, if you came because it's about the money, then you didn't come with good intentions. Sure, I want my expenses reimbursed, but if, if they don't get reimbursed, I'm not losing sleep over it because that's not the reason I came. Um, Wesley and Michael, the organizers, are getting a lot of um, haters and a lot of flack, uh, accusations and rumors, and it's just not right. Um, you're in the military, and in the military, you don't get... Um, you do not get reimbursed that quickly. You should know better. And people are getting impatient and saying, well, where's the $1.2 million? Do you have any idea what a charter bus costs? I mean, a charter bus costs $350 per hour and $6 per mile. Now, from California, that's about 1,400 miles from Sacramento. Um, Washington may be a little shorter, but L.A. a little longer and so on. And that adds up. Plus the fact that we had to feed all the veterans who were stuck in the um, stuck in the uh, casino. We had to feed them, and that was the buffet, which was the only choice. We did we couldn't bring any food in because the roads were closed. We had a bus that slid off the road. The bus I was in slid off the road. We waited three hours for a um, plow to come over and pull us out. We get to the to the uh, gas station and the bus gets stuck in the snow. So just getting to the entrance of the casino from the gas station was a chore. It, it was 60 hour mile winds, it was one, it was a minus 20, it was freaking cold. And I could only grab like one bag, so I was in the same clothes for like three days with no shower. And a lot of people were in the same, same predicament. And some people got stuck out at camp and had to be rescued. There were cars off the road um, had slid off the road because some people came not realizing that they didn't know how to drive in snow or they didn't know how to, um, or they came without chains. Who sends a charter bus into North Dakota without chains? That makes no sense to me whatsoever. Once we got there, there were a couple hundred. I know the next morning when I got up, there were at least a thousand. And when you get a lot of people confined into one small area. You've got different personalities and personal spaces just not there. And you've got some people who are just not going to get along. I know for a fact that a few RTLs decided to leave their group and uh, let them fend for themselves. And they got out on their own. So this groups of people, these small little groups of people were kind of left. Uh, another RTL decided that she wanted to go off and do her own thing and didn't stay with the group. And she left and didn't give the people that she had in her, her car a chance to um, help out. She just decided that, hey, I'm not staying anymore. I'm leaving. And we had another RTL that decided that the only way she could get heard was to yell at people. So we had a lot of problems at the evacuation center. Me and Emmy worked for a couple of hours thinking, okay, what can we do? Uh, Michael was still there and we realized that the bus that we had was not coming up north. They weren't allowing anybody to come up north because if you didn't have chains or a four-wheel drive, they weren't going to let you come up north. So we actually had to fly out and we had, again, no way of getting to Bismarck. Now the road they have blocked is a 20-minute drive to get to Bismarck Airport. But obviously they've got it blocked off, which I think is illegal, which is illegal, I think. And I don't know what gives them the right to block that road. So um, we had to drive south and then back up north, which was about a two hour drive considering the weather. And we commandeered a borrowed, I think that's a better word for it, a four wheel drive. And two of my guys, not my guys, two of the L.A. guys 
actually uh, drove three people at a time, three people and gear at a time, back and forth to the airport. Now, 27 people divided by three, you figure it out. Um, they drove pretty much all night long. So two hours there, two hours back, two hours there, two hours back. Um, I made sure, and Emmy and I made sure that everybody got out. We were the last car out. It was 9 a.m. Actually, uh, no, it was... Uh, it was 6.30 a.m. when we finally got in the car to get to the um, hotel where we were staying. Um, we got there at 9 a.m., so we had just enough time to take a shower, pause, eat a, a little bit of breakfast, and get to the airport. I know poor Emmy had to deal with luggage and made a decision at the airport that it was going to cost too much for luggage and decided to put all the luggage on a U-Haul where Tebow and Crash um, <laughs> drove it all the way from North Dakota <laughs> to Los Angeles, which got done. Um, there were some problems when we got to Las Vegas. One person didn't give the proper name, and Emmy had to go back to the desk and take care of that. And the, in, in, the inter in, the, in the meantime, he missed his flight. So <laughs> there was one problem after another, and I think that once everybody got home... It was like any other fires that we have to put out, anything more. So we got everything taken care of. I learned a lot from the Native Americans and felt extremely spiritual. And there was like something that had awakened in me, that, that hole that a lot of people want to fill. And it was amazing. The blessing was amazing. Um, to have the chief come up you come up to you, either salute you, shake your hand, handed you a feather, closed your hand around the feather, and then um, did the sage cleansing, it, it made me cry. Um, I also spoke to an elder who told me the story about the four drums, which I have on my YouTube channel. And a, um, a, a Ogallala Native American who had brought her poor mother in, an 80-year-old mother who had dementia and didn't know what was going on. And she told me the story about the significance of the teepee and why it is made the way it is, which I also have on my YouTube channel. But I had a traumatic experience three and a half years ago. I won't go into details about it, but I filled that hole with reckless behavior. Um, nothing that was illegal or anything like that. Just stuff that I shouldn't have done. And I was trying to fill that void with things that were short-lived. And going to Standing Rock and being around the Native Americans there and, and, and witnessing the drum circles and the um, welcoming where they got all the, the vets and the chiefs and their beautiful feather headdresses and their beaded, beads and um, the, the chanting and the drums and everything and going around the uh, venue area, the um, auditorium area, it was just remarkable. And it's hard for me to describe what I felt, but it was like something spiritually came into me and said, hey, you now have purpose. And this is how it feels to be completely fulfilled there are some people who um, fill that hole with materialistic things. They have to have five cars. They have to have three homes and a yacht and a private plane. It's all about who they know, how much money they make. And you don't realize that all of that stuff can be taken away from you at any given moment. What's in here can never be taken away, ever. When you die, it's still going to be with you. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that, that you have really got to dig deep within and feel, allow that spirituality to come into you and, and feel what it feels. It just, it's hard for me to explain it. It's just an extremely, extremely good feeling of self-awareness. Um, I just know the good part of it was speaking to the natives and being around them. They're beautiful kind, compassionate, caring, loving people with big hearts. And it's very easy to take advantage of those kinds of people. I know because I've been taken advantage of like that. And I continue to be very giving and I continue to get hurt. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to be jaded and not um, give. And I think 
the fact that the government thinks it's okay that they can come in here and take advantage of these people because they have good hearts and they don't think they're going to fight, they're very wrong. They've been out there for a while and they're going to continue to be out there. This is the first winter that they are fighting. They're not giving up. I'm not giving up. Whatever it is I have to do, make phone calls, write letters, I don't know, anything and everything. I'm still going to fight until this oil company reroutes that pipeline somewhere else besides through the lake. Go there to help. I've seen a couple of GoFundMe um, campaigns that are completely unrelated to helping out the the Lakota Nation out there. Uh, one guy just wants to take photographs. He doesn't want to help. He wants to raise money. He's raised a couple thousand dollars so he could put his stuff in storage and leave his house and come out there and take photographs. That's not helping them. How is that helping them? We have another girl who set up a, a GoFundMe page for tattoos, Standing Rock Tattoos. She's made over $110,000. None of that money is going for shelters or food or anything. It's for her, for her stupid tattoos. It's ridiculous. So, and they're taking, people are taking advantage of this whole GoFundMe. Oh, I'll, if I just slap Standing Rock on there, people are going to donate. I'm trying to raise $2,000 so I can take myself and a small group back out there so we can help build the winter shelters and build a, a kitchen and um, set things up for the veterans who are there. I hope to get back out there soon. Um, I'm going to put my link uh, down below with my GoFundMe page. I, I would like to get out there as soon as I can. Um, please donate if you can. Any amount would will help. Um, there's six of us going and we just need expenses to get out there. Plus, um, uh, we're going to bring a trailer of firewood and propane out there uh, for not just the vets, but for the natives as well. So please donate if you can. Link is below.